Hello, hello everyone. Thank you so much, Catherine and Manuel, for those great conversations uh, kicking off today's program. I'm Callie Bowdy, Executive Vice President, General Manager at Politico, and we're so pleased to have you here with us today for Politico's conversation on the future of grid reliability. But before we move on to the editorial panel conversation, I'd like to thank our sponsor, National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, NRECA, for their support in today's programming. On stage with me today is NRECA's Chief Executive Officer, Jim Matheson. For those less familiar with the association, NRECA's mission is to promote, support, and protect the community and business interests of electric cooperatives. NRECA has helped ensure reliable energy for millions across the country and are working to improve quality of life for the communities they serve. Prior to his role, Jim was a principal leading public policy practice for the international law firm Squire Patton Boggs. And as many of you may already know, he served as an elected U.S. representative from Utah from 2001 to 2015. Jim, thanks so much for joining today. Well, it's great to be here. Glad we're having this discussion. For those of you tuning in via live stream, please continue to follow today's conversation using hashtag Politico Energy. Okay, Jim, to begin, can you paint a picture of the growing electric reliability challenges that are facing the nation? How did we get here? Well, we're getting there partly because we're using more and more electricity. It's really interesting that the economy is uh, just demanding more electricity, and it's a lot of factors. I mean, we're using computer capacity, and we're going to cloud computing, and those data centers use a lot of electricity, and there's no end in sight for the development of new data centers. AI is going to create even more demand for electricity. Uh, for the first time in 30 years, industrial electric demand in this country is actually going up. For 30 years, it was their flatter declining. So we are electrifying this economy more and more in terms of new use. And that doesn't include electric vehicles and switching to heat pumps and all the other components where you see more electrical use in this country. So demand is going up. Supply is not keeping up with it. And so our margins are getting thin. They're not keeping up for a few reasons. One is it's hard to build new capacity in this country. It's hard to build a new solar plant. It's hard to build a new wind plant. It's hard to build a new gas turbine plant. It's hard to build a transmission line. It takes time to do these things. It takes a lot of capital. Uh, to the extent we're also shutting down some always available capacity, you're creating less supply. So that mix between supply and demand is getting a little into the danger zone, and that's the concern we have about electric reliability. It's a good news story in terms of the economy growing. It really is. It's just how is the electric grid going to keep up with that to meet that growth? So earlier this year, the EPA unveiled its new power plant proposal as Americans, as you just mentioned, continue to increase their dependence upon electricity. NRECA and I believe it was over 273 other electric cooperatives have publicly opposed it. Help us better understand what the proposal mandates and why co-ops perceive it as a threat to reliability. Sure, this is a proposed rule, and it's a proposed rule that really, uh, we think, violates the Clean Air Act in terms of the authority of the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, the effort of here is to uh, transition to less carbon resources. I understand that. Uh, but this uh, proposed rule has a couple of fundamental flaws. First of all, it mandates the use of two technologies that really aren't ready for prime time. It says if you want to, and this is for both coal and gas, you either have to use carbon capture and sequestration, or you have to use hydrogen. You have to be ready to do that by the year 2031, which is not that far away when it comes to planning and investments and infrastructure in the electric sector. So how do we get there when these technologies aren't even ready? It's fascinating that uh, this is a proposed rule that talks about aspirationally, well, we hope the technology's ready. And it's an old cliche, hope in the very good strategy. Uh, we oppose the rule for that reason. We don't think it can be modified. Our comments say let's withdraw that rule. I don't think they thought for one second about electric reliability when they were drafting up this rule. And I think our comments are really clear on the technical side, on the legal side, and on the infrastructure side about what it takes to make this happen, that this rule is not going to work for this country. It's going to mean less electricity, more power outages, and higher expense. That's not what we should be doing. So to put a finer point on this, NERC, as we all know, the nation's leading electric reliability watchdog, named U.S. energy policy as one of five major threats to grid reliability in the recent risk assessment report they yeah. just released. How is energy policy a roadblock to the reliable and affordable flow of power? Well, I think, I, I, and I want to repeat what you said in the question, because I think it's yeah. pretty significant. The North America Reliability Corporation, NERC, which issues risk reports on a periodic basis, now a new risk factor, first time we've seen it, is public policy. 
It's no longer all the other risk factors they say about supply and demand and challenges with, with uh, grid congestion, all those other issues creating reliability concern. Now it's policy. That's another concern. And by the way, it's at the state level and it's at the federal level as well. And there's a disconnect between where policy is taking us and the capacity of, of, of the electric sector to get there in terms of having available generation. Um, so I find that uh, a telling moment. NERC is a uh, professional organization. They don't engage in advocacy. I think they're a respected voice in this conversation. It's something that we certainly pay attention to because we think it really validates the same concerns that I'm hearing for electric cooperatives across the country. So um, we're here in Washington. We're here to talk about the policy environment. And I can tell you one piece of bad policy is a proposed rule from the EPA. So where then should policymakers be focusing their attention as we're thinking about all these increasing power demands? Well, the first step is the old cliche, when you're in a hole, stop digging deeper. Uh, let's stop doing policies that are shutting down power plants that have useful life. If you're going to do a transition to a different set of generation, it's going to take time to make that happen. It's going to take advancements in technology from where we are today, because if you just replace everything with intermittent resources, I'm here to tell you, four hours of battery storage, that's not long-term storage, and that doesn't fix the problem. You need a, a component, a significant component of the supply portfolio that is the always available generation and you can't take that away. On the other hand, I can say that uh, when it comes to new technology, to uh, solar battery combinations and wind battery combinations, take a look at the response to the electric cooperative movement to the $10 billion program that was in the IRA that's being distributed by the Department of Agriculture. We had over $93 billion of projects proposed by electric cooperatives across the country that are clean energy projects. So cooperatives are looking at participating in expanding and diversifying the resource base in having renewable energy as a component of that portfolio, and they've responded to those incentives really well. That's good policy, to incent people to make those types of investments. What's bad policy is forcing closure of reliable assets that therefore compromise electric reliability in the grid. And by the way, if we are concerned about trying to lower overall carbon footprint economy-wide in this country, Again, it's going to take more and more and more electricity. So as critical as electricity is today in the way our economy functions, it's going to be more critical in the future. And having a reliable source of electricity, I think, is critical to making whatever carbon reductions you're going to make economy-wide in this country. I'll tell you what, you start having more and more disruptions and more and more rolling blackouts, you're going to lose from a political standpoint real quick in terms of the public is. So let's make sure we're not messing with an electric grid, which is pretty special today, and it's going to be foundational where we go in the future. When we spoke before, Jim, you were talking just about the high level of urgency on this. So why should I or folks in the audience really be concerned? You just mentioned rolling blackouts, and, and you've talked a, a little bit about some of the things that are at stake here. But what really do you think is, is going to happen? And are you optimistic that Washington can actually meet this challenge? Well, I think, uh, look, I'm not trying to sound like Chicken Little and say the sky is falling, but I will say this. The margins are shrinking in terms of reserve margins. We've seen situations just as recently as last winter on Christmas Eve where nine states in the Mid-Atlantic region had rolling blackouts. Uh, the winter before it happened in Texas. We've seen utilities across the country during the past year uh, be engaging in cur curtailing use, whether it's voluntary, they're asking people to cut back their use, or mandatory for interruptible customers. This is happening more and more. We had an announcement from TVA a couple of months ago they said that they will not approve any new project in the TVA service territory that's more than five megawatts for firm power because they can't guarantee they can deliver it. That's not good for economic development in the valley. So we see these signs out here that we're right on the edge. And we have, as I said, this, this sector can make decisions and it can be involved in a transition, but this is not the type of uh, business where you make a decision on a dime and it happens right away, where you can put new infrastructure in and just, there it is. It takes years to develop new infrastructure in this industry. And I don't think that is well understood in the policy arena, and it's up to the electric sector to talk about it. Okay, Jim, one last question. Let's look 10 years into the future. If we harness the reliability of the grid and we take the measures necessary in order to uh, increase our uh, uh, supply of electricity, are we living in a Jetsons future? What is the biggest innovation or one of the biggest innovations you can see us having? 
Well, I hope I'm here in 10 years, first of all. <laughs> and I, look, look, I would say that we need technology to evolve. And, and it, it, you, you can pick any of a few and hope that some of them happen. For example, uh, battery storage today, can we make it where it's true longer term storage? Can the technology evolve where that can happen in, a, in an economically and technically viable way? Not four hours, not eight hours. It's got to be a lot longer than that. Can we find a way for uh, small modular reactors to actually happen? You know, the old joke that everyone says is, We've been saying they're 10 years away for the last 30 years. But can it get there? Can it get there? The, the, the first one's supposed to come online in the Idaho National Lab in 2029. Maybe it does. That would be significant. Can we find ways to uh, break the log jam on what it takes to build an electric transmission line in this country? Because it takes a decade or longer before it, maybe you're successful, maybe you're not. So there are a lot of different variables where you could have a more positive situation 10 years from now. And they don't, well, I'd like to see they all happen. I just mentioned three or four. But uh, there are a number of variables out there that could fall in a better direction. But in the interim, let's be careful with uh, digging the hole deeper, as I said, let's be careful about setting policy in a way where we're maintaining what we've got. I'm not talking about freezing time with old technology. That's not the message here. The message here is making an informed decision and a pragmatic decision about how you can have whatever the energy transition is ultimately going to be. Let's be thoughtful about what it takes to really get there. Well, hopefully in 30 years, we won't say we're 10 years away still. Uh, on that note, I'd like to wrap up this great conversation. It's a pleasure to have you join sure. me today, Jim. Thank you so much. And thank you again to NRECA for your support of today's program. With that, we look forward to welcoming back Politico Energy reporter Catherine Morehouse on stage for our next conversation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jim.